Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, About that day and hour no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. The Gospel of the Lord. Earlier in the announcements, um, my voice is not in good shape this morning, so you'll have the privilege of Justin, my brother, is here this morning. They're gonna, he's going to come finish the sermon if my voice happens to go out. He hasn't seen it yet, but he's going to finish it. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I can remember this time of year waking up extremely early, getting all bundled up, gloves, boots, hat, all of that kind of stuff, and heading out the door of the cabin. A hike of maybe a mile or two, in the pitch black of the morning, all while trying to be really quiet, not making too much noise along the way. And I remember walking, and and eventually, even in the dark, you find your spot, you sit down, and you listen, and you watch, and you wait. And as I sat there in the darkness, I remember thinking that the sound of that silence of the early, early morning was almost deafening. It 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 was palpable, almost. There was nothing moving and hardly a sound. And then as the sun begins to change from, or as the sky begins to change from black to blue to shades of orange and yellow and the sun begins to come up, and then all of a sudden the forest seems to come alive. And with each passing minute, the light makes something a little bit more visible, a little bit more noticeable. And the woods seemed to come to life. The details of God's creation that surrounded me all of a sudden were visible. I grew up in a family that that hunted, especially during deer season pretty regularly. And that's what I tend to remember from those experiences. It's it's not whether I got something any particular year or not. It's the, the notion and the feeling and even the image that is still painted in my mind of seeing the sun as it rises in the forest, and as things just come to life, and you start to hear the squirrels yelling at you and the birds chirping. I haven't hunted in a number of years now. But those pictures, those images, and even the sound is still vivid in my mind. Waiting, watching for daylight to come. As God's people, we have been called out of darkness and into the light. We've been called out of the darkness that sometimes this world casts us with, shadows us with, into God's light. And today we begin our our Advent journey, and we light one candle. The prophet Isaiah is where we begin our Advent journey this morning in our Old Testament reading. In the first chapter, he he just finished describing really all of the the sinful behavior, the unfaithfulness of God's people in the world. And at the beginning of our reading, we then get this, this phrase that starts it off. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw. Now think about that for a minute. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw. Normally, we don't think about words, especially these kinds of words, as being things that we, that we see. 
And yet what, what Isaiah is really describing is almost more of a, a, a painting, a vision that God is placing before him in words. To see and then especially to share with the world. And it's a vision of peace. It's a vision of reconciliation. It's a vision of unity. It's a vision of all people gathering around God. It talks about a time when all people will flock to Zion. When all people will flock to Jerusalem, to the temple. It's a vision of the end times, what God will do when all things are made new. It's one of those apocalyptic kind of texts, those end times kinds of texts that we find, especially in this first part of our Advent season. <coughs> our gospel text reminds us from Matthew that we also aren't going to know when any of this happens. It's God's time. It's what God is going to do, and if we knew, we would be like the, house, the homeowner who, if they knew when the thief was coming, would wait and make sure their house was not broken into. Christ's return, God's coming, will be just as abrupt and just as surprising. And yet we hear this image of peace. People flocking to the city of Jerusalem. But the image isn't just about people coming to the city of Jerusalem because that's where the temple was. It's people coming to the city of Jerusalem because God lived in the temple. It's people coming to God, people coming to God's house. It doesn't have to be just a city or a location. Zion is about the one who resided there, God. The one that all nations in this vision flock to. This image, each time I hear it, this passage, each time I hear it from Isaiah, it just seems to be so far from our reality. We hear about beating swords into plowshares, spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, and we will not learn war anymore. Well, if anything, it seems to be the other way around for us. We keep getting better and better, or at least more efficient at war and destruction, and even creating some of that that darkness in our world. Isaiah offers us an invitation, especially in the last verse of his writing for this morning. <coughs> it's the invitation where he says, Come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Isaiah isn't denying that there's darkness in the world. That there's, there's danger, there's bad things, there's evil in the world. But instead what he's saying is, as God's people, we are to look for the light. We are to walk in God's light. Isaiah invites us through faith to know the reality of what it means to be a people of, of hope, of looking forward, of preparation and joy. Christ brought his light into our world. We don't, we don't have to recreate it. We just simply are, are challenged and tasked with spreading Christ's light to be part of that mission into all of the dark corners of the world. Out of darkness and into the light as God's people were challenged and called to live not in those dark places, even though it's all around us. We're called to live and carry with us Christ's light. That light is what helps to give us clarity, I think, in the world. Just like sitting there on a Monday morning in hunting season as the sun begins to come up, at first you really can't see anything. You can't see the details. You can't see what's a deer and what's a tree branch. <coughs> you can't see what's a squirrel and what's just a tree stump. But as the light comes up, we can begin to see with clarity and honesty what's before us. Christ's light helps us in just that same way. <coughs> Christ's light helps us in just that same way to see things honestly, to see the people and the things around us for what they are, to see poverty and inequality and justice and the people that are forgotten and lost in life. And even for us to see those opportunities more clearly where we can be the courageous people of Christ, braving to enter those dark places and bring a little bit of joy and hope and peace 
You see, because we have no need to fear the darkness. We have no need to fear the darkness of death and evil because Jesus has already overcome both. We live as a people of promise. The promise of light, the promise of forgiveness, the promise of resurrection. Yet we live in a world where darkness and fear sometimes seem to prevail on a regular basis. <coughs> but we don't need to fear it. We don't need to fear the darkness of uncertainty and grief, the darkness of bullying and loneliness, the darkness of diagnosis and broken relationships, as real and as terrible and as painful as those things are. So in the face of darkness in our world, how do we walk in the light of Christ? I think first and foremost, we have to understand and remember that we don't walk in the light of God alone. God walks with us each and every step of the way, and we also walk with a community of faith together in that light. So that as one of us, our path might seem a little bit more shadowed at one moment or another. It takes the other person to pull us back and remind us of God's light. Second, we also need to be reminded of the fact that the darkness won't last. The darkness of this world isn't final. God's brilliant and divine light has already won. And because of that news, we walk boldly and courageously in the light of the Lord. Being bold in our faith, being bold in our witness and in our proclamation, and able to focus on the ministry and the gifts that God gives us right here and right now. I also think it is I also think it means that we can reflect on the grace that's already been given to us by God and risk and risk forgiving others even when we might find it difficult to do so. We can risk welcoming others even when we're comfortable in our own little circles. We can risk defending someone who has no means of defending themselves. In the last few months, we've been talking about the path of discipleship. Walking in the light of the Lord is that same path. And it's not a leisurely walk. It's not just a little stroll. The journey of discipleship is a challenging one. And it's in, done in the face of darkness. But we walk and live as those called out of the darkness and into the light. God's marvelous light. Thanks be to God for that light of Christ. Amen.